And yeah, um, you already heard my introduction uh, at the beginning. Um, this talk is about futures in Rust. Uh, an introduction. It's it's going quite deep, but uh, in the end, it's it's still only scratching the surface in a way. But you'll see. So, wait. So, what is a future? Actually, what are we talking about? Uh, one way of defining it is a representation of a value that may not be yet available, but will be in the future. Thus, the name, or another name, is promise. You might have heard that from JavaScript, for example, or uh, the, the term future is used in Java, for example, in the name completable future. Um, promise because it's a promise that there will be a value even if there's non none yet, but there will be one in the future. <laughs> so why would we need futures? Let's, let's take an example. It's an example that I took from uh, from my work, essentially, in a simplified form. Let's say you want to download an image, and then you want to convert it into a different format. Synchronously, you would do something like that. You have a function fetch and convert that takes a URL of an image and returns some kind of result. Um, you download the image from the URL, um, returning errors on the way, and then you convert it. The, the download is waiting for the network, and the conversion is CPU-intensive. I have a little diagram here for you. Um, while the, the thread that is, doing the, uh, that is executing the code um, is waiting for the network, it isn't doing anything. And then once uh, the network is, uh, request has finished and all the data um, has arrived, um, the conversion is starting and is using up the CPU with CPU intensive work um, until it is finished. Uh, so far, it's, it's not that bad. You, you have to wait anyways um, for, for your network request. Um, but the CPU intensive work and the blocking might be bad if you if you're doing it on a, a GUI main thread or something like that. Um, now, if you want to do it in a loop with many URLs, you might you might write something like that. For every URL in in an iterator of URLs, you do the conversion, and then it gets worse because now. You, you are spending time that, you, I mean, you, you, you can start the down, you could have started the download uh, in, in parallel and uh, use the time you've been waiting for the download in the second iteration for converting the, the first uh, image. Um, what you might do to, to fix this is spawn threads. So in this case, uh, I, I, I wasn't using the, the iterator um, style of programming because uh, it's harder to read on the slide. You have a list of thread handles, join handles is what they're called, a vector. And for every URL, you spawn a new, th a new thread where you try to fetch and convert the, uh, the URL uh, and, and yeah, fetch the image and convert it. And in the end, you wait for all threads to finish. That would be one way to, to do this in parallel. This would so look something like that. Problem is, you have some OS scheduling overhead for the threads. Um, you, it's, it's hard to compose. Um, I'll have a slide on that one. And right now, we're not doing anything with the results. If this is writing to, to the hard drive in some way, Oh, there's a question already. No, there's not. So maybe I am able to read the chat, um, the questions from the chat. Um, so if, if we're writing to the hard drive, that might not be a problem. But if we want to collect the images and the, the converted images and do something with it, um, this might not be viable. And we, we would need some kind of 
um, cross-thread uh, synchronization to collect the the results of this computation and stuff like that it, it gets complicated really quick and also in this simple example um, you have the additional problem that um, all operations are starting at once so if you have like 100 URLs you you might blow your your memory you, and and get other problems with your internet connection or um, the target where you where, where you're downloading the images from so this is not a very good solution there are better things you can do with threads for example using a thread pool and and stuff like that but uh, let's not let's not go into that more right now That's quite interesting because that essentially means that a thread join handle is in some way a kind of future, just not just just not the kind of future that that we've been talking about. But um, comparing it to some other languages, it it would still be a future in a way. Um, what do I mean by bad composability? Um, let's say. Uh, I have galleries that I want to download, image galleries. One of them has many images. And to, to download one, we can spawn our threads. So far, so good. But what if we have many galleries and we want, want to also uh, parallelize this in some way? If we would then spawn all these threads, we would be very sad because we had would have some code that recursively spawns more threads and you, you do not want that because it can result in like exponential growth of spawning threads and that's that's not very good so uh what is the solution the solution of futures and i i want to make one thing clear futures are not is uh, not not one way to implement something, but uh, futures in general uh, are just a concept, a a semantic of how to work with asynchronous uh, computation and results. So um, even though different languages implement it in, in different ways, they're essentially semantically all the same thing. And one way to express that is using um, the async await semantics. In this case, we would have uh, download and con convert as asynchronous operations. And um, to, to create our fetch and convert um, async uh, function, we would first have to call the download method, await the result, and then using the result, con convert it and wait for the conversion to finish. Um, this looks almost exactly like um, implementing it synchronously, but uh, there's a big difference. Uh, every time an await point is reached, the, few, the, the, the execution of this method can be suspended. That's the, the essential point, but we're going to come back to that. Um, the, the old syntax of how this would be implemented in Rust would be uh, you would have a function that returns an impl future. If you don't know, uh, do all of you know impl? If nobody answers, I, I'll assume yes. Um, and and then you, you, you could use combinators like that. So Oh, there's a, actually there's an error in the slide. This async shouldn't be here. Um, we, we could call the download method and then schedule the conversion to happen once the download has finished by calling dot and then with a closure that takes an image and converts the image. 
in this case, we could also use the shorthand um, syntax where we only pass convert directly into the and then um, method. But uh, this way, it's clearer to, to see what's happening on the slides. So that's just the, the semantics of, of how you could write code like that. Um, this is more like a functional um, monad style of implementing it. It's, it's similar to how iterators work, essentially, in, in Rust, at least. So how could this be implemented, and how, how is it roughly implemented in, in many languages out there, although not Rust? One way that's popular is um, uh, if you want to make asynchronous functions, you just give them a callback parameter. You might know that from JavaScript or, or even from, from C for that matter. Um, once the asynchronous operation is finished, the callback gets called and you can um, decide what, what's happening next. This would so look something like that. And that's um, where the name callback hell is coming from, because you, you, as you can imagine, if you have long chains of asynchronous operations, this nesting can become very, very deep. And uh, also there's another problem. Once this chain has started, it's hard to, to, to make it stop, because once the download is finished, it calls the... Uh, the callback, which will then start the conversion operation, which when it's finished, will call the, the finish callback. And if you want to stop this, um, because uh, maybe the, it, the download operation was stopped in a GUI, for example, for uh, like, like so with some button that, that tells you to, to stop downloading, um, you would need to do additional work to make it stop. You, you might have to uh, pass through some kind of Boolean um, if you're supposed to keep running or something like that. Um, then uh, then what, what's, what's done a lot as a step up from, um, from callbacks is to take the callback and put it into uh, your future. This is kind of how um, JavaScript does it. Uh, let's say we would have a trade callback future with, with an associated type for the output type and then a method that takes a callback that will be called once uh, the operation has finished. And for example, you would implement your download operation uh, in some way where it takes the, the callbacks, uh, it stores the callback so it can be called once it's done. Um, yeah, the, actually implementing this in Rust is quite hard because the ownership model is not very well suited for, for this kind of code. You, you would probably need at least something like, R, uh, like RefCell or, or Mutex or something like that, uh, and it would get complicated very quickly. But I think PromiseKit in the Swift programming language, for example, does it like this and um, JavaScript does something similar, although they have uh, two callbacks, one for uh, the success case and one for the error case. Um, one way to simplify this is to still store a callback, but without passing the data to the callback itself. So you, you would have something like a trade callback that has one method, notify ready, which gets called once the uh, operation has completed. And then your callback future trade would be something like uh, you can set a callback, um, you can check if uh, the future is ready, just a Boolean check, true if it's ready and false if not, and you can take out the output um, where you would get the you would you would have have the output in an option internally and you can call the the take method in internally on the option so once it's been taken out once it will be gone not not like in other languages because of the ownership rules uh, so that's how it's usually implemented with callbacks 
Any questions so far? Okay, then I'm going to continue. So how is it actually done in Rust? First, some terminology. Um, one term I want to introduce is a task. A task is a unit of execution or rather a scheduled future or, or also called green thread. Um, scheduled future because it a, a task is a future, but, but it's a future that has been started or has been scheduled to run. And it usually is a composition of multiple futures that it, uh, so so it's you, you can just use a regular future and, and spawn it as a task but usually your task is a future that is composed of several futures for example um, if you are implementing a web server backend uh, your entire server could be one future uh, that is running the entire time uh, un un until your program finishes essentially Uh, an executor is uh, what can run your tasks or rather run your futures as tasks and thus all the scheduling. So what you would say is futures are spawned on executors to become tasks. So once the future has been spawned, it has become a task. And now how do these futures work? This is the actual um, future trait from the standard library. Um, it has an associated output type for the the for what the the asynchronous operation results in, and you have this Paul method. It takes a pin of self. I'm going to explain that further later, and a context, and it returns a Paul of the output. And poll is similar to an option. It's either ready with, an, uh, with a uh, value or it's pending. So es essentially polling a future is like opening the door to, to check if a, if a parcel has arrived. Let's say you ordered something on the internet and um, you, you have no idea when it will arrive and you, you, you're regularly showing up to the door, opening it and checking if the parcel is there. But in that picture, there's one big question. Where is the doorbell? If we're just pulling it, um, that would be like an endless loop and very inefficient. Uh, we, we, never, we would never know when to actually open the door and check if something is there. So if you take a closer look at uh, the context parameter of the uh, poll method of the future, you may notice the, the context. Let's go back um, the, the context over here. Um, and one method that the context has is the waker method. And looking at that, there is a wake by ref method that takes no additional parameter. So this is where um, the notification happens. That's your callback, essentially. And wake is called once a task can make progress. What does that mean? It doesn't mean it's, it gets called when a future is finished. It means it gets called when a future can do additional work. So, for example, uh, we have the executor that is running a, a future at the moment, a task, and it, it pulls the task. Um, the task responds with pending, meaning uh, I'm not finished yet, come back later, and then some, some time uh, passes and then it, inside of the task some asynchronous event happens some something happens so it calls the waker uh, and the executor can schedule the future to be to be polled again you can think of it like a a stack of futures that are uh, waiting to be polled again um, and 
some of the executors actually implemented ex exactly like that. Uh, then the executor would pull the task again. Uh, the pull would then trigger internal progress in some kind of uh, in, in in some fashion. Depends on the implementation, but it might not yet be finished, so it still uh, returns pending. And this can repeat as as many times as uh, is required for your actual uh, asynchronous operation. And at some point. Um, there's an event for the future being finished, although from the 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 waker doesn't know it yet. It just knows something happened. Some some progress can be made, and now that the executor pulls the future again, it gets uh, a ready result back. So at that point, the future has finished. So you have a polling method uh, of of checking if the future is there, but um, you still get notified if once you have to poll, and the 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 big leap in understanding what what is happening there is uh, the difference between g getting a callback once the operation is completely finished versus getting a callback every time some progress can be made, which is what uh, futures in Rust actually do. Um, one important guarantee that the future has to uphold uh, there is um, the once a future returns pending when being polled it must ensure that wake is is going to be called again in the future otherwise um, the executor will never know to to continue polling the future and it will just stall it will wait forever deadlock essentially not a deadlock in the um, in the strict sense of the word, but you, you, you probably get what I mean. And um, it, it really depends in your poll method, uh, the, the poll method. Uh, so uh, sorry, I have to repeat the question if uh, before the recording. Um, if you're trying, if you're implementing a Mandelbrot set, you, would you implement the actual cal calculation in Paul? And I'd say it it, it depends. Um, you should not do any uh, blocking or expensive operations in the Paul method itself. All blocking or expensive operations should be done asynchronously in some way. It it could be the operating system in 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 the case of network requests, it, it could be some kind of thread pool in, in the case of uh, converting the image, for example, something like Rayon or something like that. Um, but poll itself must be quick and uh, not do anything expensive. Although in simple cases, you it, it might be okay to actually do some calculation inside of the poll method. Let's say you, you just, uh, I mean, if, you, if you're calculating a Mandelbrot set, you, you couldn't use a future for single pixels, I guess. So you would have to calculate everything or, or rather use a stream. So I, I guess you would... So the... the So when you so if you're splitting the Mandelbrot set into portions, um, that's that needs to be done asynchronously because the future can only represent the Mandelbrot being set being finished calculating essentially. Um, otherwise, you would use a stream to implement that. I'm going to talk about streams later.
So the, the comment for the recording, um, if you were, were to, for example, split up the Mandelbrot set and uh, calculate it on different hosts on the network, you, you could use the poll method to check if the, the calculation, uh, to, to schedule the calculation on the other hosts and check if the result ha has come back, something like that. Um, but you, you can think of a task as a state machine. In our example, um, it would start out uh, in the not started state. And once it gets polled, it transitions to the uh, state where it has sent the request, for example. And it would, it would keep in that state. I, I forgot an, an arrow there. So you, you could poll it again, but it would keep in that state until it got the response and uh, will then, then start reading the response. Uh, every time you pull it, it would go back to reading until it has finished, uh, where you would then uh, go in the converting state, keep there until it has finished, then convert it and to the finished state where you, where you would got, get your poll ready, essentially. So in the transition from converted to finished, um, your poll uh, that is happening uh, on this error is arrow essentially um, would return the result of the conversion and in that picture you, you can see that although the task is one big state machine it consists it consists of several smaller ones which represent represent the future for the download and for the conversion Uh, so, what that what does this get us? Um, this makes it possible to have so-called zero overhead futures. Um, we we don't need any heap allocations, um, although we usually have one per task because uh, if we want to spawn an arbitrary number of tasks, we we need to heap allocate them, and but it can be done without any heap allocations at all, which makes it uh, usable for embedded development. Um, this is done by usually composing uh, everything into one struct, uh, struct. So as you've seen, the, the state machine would be one struct in memory, for example, or one enum, but, but one data structure in memory uh, that just changes state internally as it gets polled uh, but it doesn't need any pointers to outside memory or doesn't need, need to get doesn't need any pointers to callbacks or anything like that um, there's only this one pointer to the the context that gets passed around but um, the context is one single thing per task and um, the compiler can also inline across poll methods. So if you if you call a, a poll method uh, that calls the poll method of a contained future in some sense of some upstream future, for example, it could um, the, the compiler could if it sees that just inline that call and make it more efficient and allow you to to make uh, zero overhead wrappers around futures. So, uh, so far, so good. Any questions so far? Okay. Then let's go to async generators. Um, we've seen the async await syntax uh, already. Um, and this gets compiled to a generator. So we have our generator that takes a, our, our async method. It takes a parameter and returns a result. We have some part before the await. Then we have an operation that takes the parameter. We wait for it to finish. And we have some part after that. And this roughly, this is just a hand wavy uh, translation that, that roughly compiles to this sort of enum. You, you have the generator in its new state where it hasn't been polled yet. 
and where it has the parameter. Then once you pull it, it, it will start the operation, meaning it creates a future here by calling this method, um, which it then stores. And once once you pull it in, in the operation state, it will just um, forward the pull calls to the, the contained future inside of here. And once this is finished, um, it, it would be in a state where the result is available. And this will probably already be contained in here, but I put it in here for for better explanation. And if you then in this state where it is ready, pull it again, it will return the result using pull ready and transition into the finished state. Once it is finished, Actually, that's, uh, that holds true for every future in Rust. Once it is finished, you must not pull the future anymore. Um, it, it won't do undefined behavior when you pull it again, um, because that's guaranteed by safe Rust. But it might panic, and it will most likely panic if you pull it again after it has returned ready. So let's make this more complicated. What happens if we have a lifetime across a wait point? So we have the same thing as before. We have our operation that we're waiting for. But this time, we want to print out the um, parameters um, and do it in a contrived way that uh, makes my point for this slide. Um, let's take the parameters and create a string from them and store it in a debug variable. Then do our operation and then print the parameters. This means the, the lifetime of the debug variable is longer than uh, it, it exists before this await point and after this await point. The problem with that is you ha you now have a it's not a borrow it's just a lifetime but let's say we we took a borrow here um, we we have a lifetime across this await point and usually this would be impossible in Rust because um, move would invalidate these pointers um, if if you look back to to this enum version, you would ha have something in uh, in another state that has to be borrowed, essentially, uh, to be available in, in, in this state, or, or transferred over. And the way this works is uh, by just taking a look back at the, the future trait from the standard library. Um, you may have noticed that the self is wrapped in a pin type. Um, a, a pin of uh, a mutable borrow of self. What this does is it prevents uh, it from moving. It prevents self from moving. Um, pin wraps a pointer, not a value. And on a self-referential type, so a, a struct that has a pointer to itself or an enum that has a pointer to itself. Uh, does, does, um, first of all, does everybody understand the problem with uh, self-referential types or self-referential values in that case? Because if you have, let, let me just explain it again um, because I'm, I'm not getting any, any answers here. Um, if you have a struct and you have a pointer from that struct into itself, that means you have um, a pointer to, to a location in memory uh, where, where the struct lives on the stack, for example. When you now, for example, r return that value from a function, it will be moved into a different location in memory, thereby making the pointer to itself invalid because a move is just a mem copy in, in Rust. And 
this means we need to prevent uh, the value from being moved anywhere. And pin for self-referential types can only be constructed using unsafe code. In this case, you, you, you can, of course, with unsafe code, make self-referential types because um, just put a pointer in there and it works. And for self-referential types, you can only get a, a mutable borrow um, via unsafe code. Meaning, if you, usually if you implement a, a POM method, you, you need some kind of unsafe for that. But um, for types that are not self-referential, there's the unpin marker trait, um, which is automatically implemented uh, for almost all types uh, in, in Rust, uh, similar to something like send and sync, which also automatically, uh, automatically gets implemented. And it allows you to do these, bo uh, these two operations in uh, safe Rust as well. Meaning, uh, if you really want self-referential types, you can have them using unsafe, and all the users never get the type directly, but only a pinned pointer to the type, or in this case, a pinned mutable borrow of the type, meaning they can just work with it normally uh, without uh, um, endangering the uh, safety guarantees of the language. But if they want to work with it, we, they, they can use unsafe uh, code. Uh, I hope that was. Uh, I, I hope that made sense because it is kind of uh, complicated. Yeah. So now that we we know how async, yeah, and just to make sure, all um, all async blocks or async. Um, functions in Rust are implemented as uh, types that are not um, unpin. So you cannot move async blocks, for example, at least not, un not uh, once they have started. Um, yeah, so was there a question? Thumbs up on pin versus copy slash move, okay. Um, so now that we know how the async blocks work, let's take a look at how you would actually use futures. Um, there are different runtime libraries. I mean, you, you, futures are not useful if you, if you have no way to actually run them. The most popular one is Tokyo. And for most traits out there, um, that can in some way have a and an asynchronous um, variant to them, like making network requests or talking to databases and stuff like that. For most of them, there is a Tokyo equi equivalent that you can use with the Tokyo runtime to, to make um, asynchronous, asynchronous operations. It also has um, primitives for synchronization, like a mutex and channels and, and time handling, like timeouts, sleep, and stuff like that. There's also async uh, standard, which aims to um, replicate the standard library uh, layout or like the API of the standard library, but make it asynchronous. Um, I'm not sure, it's not the, as popular as Tokyo and I haven't used it myself, so I'm, I'm not sure um, how good or bad it is, but um, I, some people th think it's very good, but I haven't seen it used any, it, it, I haven't seen it used very often. And uh, there's a library called small which has a very small but still fast implementation of a runtime just as a way to show how, how easy one can actually implement one of them. 
And by runtime, I mean uh, an executor, essentially. Then there's the futures crate. Um, I think almost every Rust program that uses futures uses the futures crate. It also lives also lives in the Rust uh, GitHub or organization. And this is actually uh, where the futures trait in the standard a uh, future trait in the standard library came from. It has been living in the uh, futures crate for a long time, and has then uh, changed a little, and has been moved into the standard library. And uh, I would expect that more types like stream and stuff like that will also move from futures to the standard library in the future. But essentially, it is the the standard library for asynchronous Rust code out there. Um, it also has the, the stream and sync traits, uh, more on that later. It has useful combinators, uh, like for example, um, on what you would have on iterator, uh, there's many methods you can call in it, like map and uh, for each and stuff like that. Um, and you've, you've seen one of them in my earlier code example, the end then method was one of these combinators. They have channels uh, to communicate asynchronously between um, tasks, and they have, have, have some useful macros. Also, one notable crate if you are implementing uh, future traits by yourself is the, the crate pin project, because it helps you to avoid having to write unsafe code yourself uh, for dealing with the pin type, like getting out data from the pin so you, uh, so you can po actually work with it. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a procedural macro uh, to annotate your, your types with, and you can then project it in the way that, j just, just take a look at it if you, if you need it, you will know it, I guess. Let's go back to our example of downloading and converting images. I've been in the theory of how futures work for almost the entire talk now, so let's talk about how we would actually use it. Let's first take a look at the original um, threading solution and port that over uh, straight over to futures. Let's say we have our fetch and convert method, which uh, is an asynchronous method. And we want to convert all of them at once, es essentially. We could, uh, oh, I, I, I spotted another mistake. That's what you get for finishing your slides almost straight before you uh, give your talk. Um, you take your URLs iterate over them uh, and map them to a call to the asynchronous method. This gives you a, a, a an iterator of futures, which you then ca can call futures join all on, which will s start them simultaneously, or rather it, it will pull all of them simultaneously. And this gives you a new future that you can await on. Um, but it's it's not optimal because they are still starting all at once and all the problems about memory usage and hammering the uh, the place where the, the server where the images are stored with network requests and stuff like that still hold so it's not the best solution what you can do there is use streams streams are asynchronous iterators essentially so what this looks like, if you, if you um, remember the future was this trait with a pull method and a, a stream is quite similar. A stream has an associated type called item, like iterators, and instead of a pull method, it has a pull next method. It also takes self by pin of mutable self and a mutable borrow of self 
and a context it's the the exact same context as in the future up here but instead of returning a poll of item it returns a poll of option of item um, more on that later and it has a size hint uh, like the iterator in the standard library so what do these poll values mean for streams pending is, is the same as a future uh, there is no value yet but internal progress was made um, if you get a ready of sum it means you get the next item of the stream like in iterators and poll ready none means uh, the stream has finished it's also the same as with iterators so let's go back to our example we have our same fetch and convert method and now we have a convert method that takes an into iterator of URLs and returns a stream of results of converted. Uh, you you can create you can create the iterator from the into iterator trait um, using the iterator and then create a stream from the iterator using the future stream iter method. So now we have a stream of URLs. This can then be mapped, also one of the combinators from the future uh, futures uh, crate. Uh, we map URLs to uh, fetch and convert URLs. So we now have a stream of futures with the result up here and can then use the try buffered combinator which uh, runs which, which essentially takes the number or, uh, that is called here of uh, futures out of the stream and then starts running them, them in parallel and w once one of the futures has finished it takes the next item from the stream and starts running it and yeah it's it's essentially the the solution of our problem that we had in the beginning it's it's composable because the output here is still just a stream of uh, results of the conversion so we we can combine it with other code that test just takes streams uh, we don't have to wait for one operation to finish because we are doing eight of them in parallel or as many as we want and uh, yeah that's just about it so that was my talk in conclusion futures are poll based they try to be zero overhead um, async await is implemented as generators uh, so like a state machine and in internally um, st standard pin pin is used for for the self-referential because of the self-referential types that generators are and there is a stream trait uh, for asynchronous iterators and this concludes my talk any more questions Yes. Okay. Um, so the question was how, um, s since there is a, a poll method and a waker that, that is called to um, notify of the, 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 the executor of any progress, how would you implement the the waker to be called in that case and the answer is it, this this really depends on the use case let's say you're making a network request um you m might be using the 
ähm, ePol API, the POSIX ePol API. Um, in that case, the, um, the operating system would call the, the, the process so that something has happened and that then can notify all the future. So you would have some central location where all the network requests are, are waiting. You store the waker there. Um, let's go back. Um, this waker is uh, Im implements copy and uh, not copy sorry clone so what you can do when you get polled the first time is take the waker make a copy of it uh, sorry a clone of it and store it somewhere and that somewhere let's say is the is something that receives the the notifications from the operating system that uh, progress has been made on your network request uh, it could then go through the all the wakers and call the correct one for the operation that you're doing at the moment or let's say you schedule an operation on a thread pool you would take your um, your bundle of work your work package essentially and when you put it on the thread pool, you would also give it a waker for the task it came from. And once uh, the operation on the thread pool has finished, it, it would just call the waker. So whoever implements the future will then um, store the waker in some way so it can call it once progress has been made. Did that answer the question? So the question was, um, are there different executors you, you could use and how would you use them? And I think that's, that's the, a point where I could start making a demo. Let's take my scratch pad here. C can you see the, um, the IDE? Okay. Let's take Tokyo, for example. Um, version one features, let's just take all of them for now because that makes it, oh, um, I have to look it up. <laughs> Wait, what? Oh. Yeah, of course. Sometimes reading helps. Did it just freeze? Oh no, it's working. So for example, what you could do is uh, let runtime equals Uh, there is a, a current thread runtime. Oh, yeah, that's what I'm looking for. New current thread. Builder. Um, maybe this makes it more readable. Runtime builder, new current thread. Don't build like that. Then you would have a runtime. 
let's take some kind of future, for example, a future that is ready immediately. Let's take the re uh, ready uh, with the number 42, for example. You could then say like runtime, oops, runtime dot block. Can we do it like that? Oh, of course, um, this can fail. Block on future print that and you would have the most complicated way of synchronously printing the number 42. And the interesting thing about this is it's it's completely running on the current thread so you, you don't even need to have a, a multi-threaded environment to, to run futures. Um, but also you could um, create a multi-thread runtime and do something like for the number in 0 to 100 um, runtime dot spawn mm. let's see make a future ready for number dot or a let's let's just use an async block print line number and then the spawn the future and at the and runtime dot wait i'm not sure how to actually wait until the last future has finished maybe somebody can help me there Yeah, I, I did that already. I have a yeah build unwrap, um, but I want to wait for the I, I I don't want main to just return and stop the program. I want to wait until all futures have finished running. Yeah, but that's not what I'm looking for. At least in the past there had been... means it's let's just sleep for 10 seconds or something like that um, don't don't try this at home exactly sleep duration from sex 10 dot uh, not dot await but um, runtime dot block on this this should do the trick. And of course, uh, a rookie mistake. But the compiler is very helpful. Um, yeah, dot unwrap. This is actually a, is this a result? No, it's, it's not a 
not a result, but it just wants me to, to have a unit type there. Function requires argument type to outlive static. How does it not copy number? Because number is a copy type. I'm, I'm not sure why, but async move should do the trick anyways. So we, we move the lifetime of the, we move the number inside of the async block and therefore the async block gets a static lifetime and can be spawned. Because every time you spawn something on, at least on a multi-thread runtime, it needs to have a static lifetime because it it gets spawned out of the current context where you spawn the future. That's why there I even is a current thread runtime in uh, in Tokyo, because it can run futures that have a lifetime bound to the current uh, current function, or it doesn't need to have a static lifetime to be spawned on there. So if you run this, you can see the numbers printed in random order. There's no reactor running, must be running. What? <laughs> I have no idea what is happening here, actually. Panic, resume, unwind. What? There's no reactor running. Oh, maybe. Let, let's let's do the way, let's do the thing that you would normally do. Yeah, I could do this. Um, if you use this, you can make your main method, um, this macro, you can make your main method a an asynchronous method and just use regular stuff on the, in there. Like this. And now it doesn't fail anymore, but you can see it, it runs in a random order because it gets spawned out. Uh, yes, if you do it like, uh, so the question was the, um, if the entire application becomes asynchronous, if you do that, um, Yes, because um, what what this does is essentially creating the the runtime manually. The thing we've done earlier, the um, using the runtime builder, and then just spawn the main method on that runtime, and once and, and blocking on that. So the the actual main method of the program will still be synchronous, but all it does is spawn the main method, the async main method, and uh, block on it, on the, on the executor. If, if you want a synchronous main method, you would have to do that manually, exactly. So let's see what this expands to. Wait. Whatever, let's do it manually. <laughs>
I, I can just use a stream um, for, for my example to, to make a point. But first, let's take a look at the um, cargo expand output. Essentially, what it does is build a new, new multi-thread uh, runtime, enable all features. Uh, this is something like a timer. If you want, if if you want to use uh, sleep, oh now I, now I know why it crashed. It's because sleep requires a timer to be enabled. Um, if you if you use uh, time-related methods of Tokyo on a runtime that has no time-related uh, ha has no timer enabled, then it will crash. Um, so enable all features, builds the future, unwraps it, and then puts the entire main method into an async block and blocks on it. This is just what the Tokyo main macro does, so it's it's no magic. And this is just the print line expanded. And uh, let's let's do it properly. Futures version 0 0.3, not dot two dot three. I hope that everything is in there now. Um, what we would do is something like um, uh, stream iter. Zero to one hundred dot uh, map number for the map uh, we need the stream x trait print line number like this. Um, if we just run it like that, we could we could could just do a for each with nothing in there and await that. That would be a, a valid way of doing this. But then it would print the numbers in order. Wait, um, oh, 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 that needs to be a future, so let's put an async block in there like this. It will print them in order right now. But yeah, the, the stream is still ordered and uh, but you can do things to make this run in, in parallel. What you could do is use the the buffered combinator that I introduced in, in my talk earlier. For this to work, We, we, we'll see about that. It depends on how it in, is implemented internally. So um, for that, we need a stream of future. So I wrapped it in an async block. And then we can use the buffered um, combinator, let's say, with a size of 10. And let's run that. Wait. This needs to be moved in there. And yes, it still runs deterministically because um, this future doesn't do anything that's actually asynchronous. So the first time you call Paul on that future, it will immediately return a result, um, which in this case means um, the. Uh, we, we still get it in order, but what we can do is, as suggested, s uh, introduce a sleep in here. Let's say one millisecond, maybe that's enough. Um, 
<laughs> Still in the same order. Take 100 milliseconds. Yeah, maybe it's too deterministic right now. I I was hoping that it it would wouldn't be as. It, let, let's just take the the rent trade in there. Like this. Use rent. I I don't know the API. Um, probably just a yeah that's that's probably what I want just some whatever random number in this case it's just yeah u8 is probably a good idea This tape U as U sixty four. That should work. And as you can see, it's not deterministic anymore. And if if I run it again, you can see how it bunches up the the like how it runs 10 of them in, in parallel. Let's take the, let's, let's like multiply this by 10 and it's easier to see. Yeah. Yeah, Felix, you had, uh, you had a question. Um, essentially that takes the output um, of the that takes the, the values in the stream which in this case is just um, a, the unit type because print line just returns unit and you can run a few create a new future that that takes this stream value as an input so um, what we could do in this case is pass the number through, for example, and then you would get, would get the number here. And in this case, the number would be in order because um, although th this runs in parallel, the output will still be ordered. And um, I can implement the same thing manually. Um, let me show you. Let stream equals. Uh, that's maybe not the best name, but it, it works, I guess. Um, for. Um, let's go back to to just um, unit types. For unit type in. No, oh, that's that's wrong. Loop. Um, stream dot next while stream dot next dot await while that some equals yeah that's essentially what it does. So um, you you can you can instead of running the stream entirely. So f what what for each does is it creates a new future that that runs the stream to completion essentially and allows you to do something with every every value that comes out of it. But we can also manually wait for every single next value in a in a, in a while loop.
What I could do is something like that. Um, async fn like this. So if I run this, nothing happens because the, the stream is not pulled. The warning is, um, wait, it's just an unused variable warning at, uh, right now, but if I remove this unused variable, it will tell me unused buffer that must be used. It's, and, and here it says streams do nothing unless polled. So that's one benefit of uh, the polling future um, paradigm. If you stop polling, it, it, it stops doing work. It, it still does the last thing it has scheduled internally to that, that will trigger the next call to wake. But other than that, it will just stop doing anything. So can you, you get cancellation for free, essentially. And you could... Uh, no, because a stream is not one future, but many futures. So that's exactly what is happening here. Um, if if you use for each here, let's go let's go back to that. Um, let's let's do it more manually. If if we use dot for each, we get a future. As you can see, it's for each of buffered of map of it <laughs> of a range of i32 it's the entire you can see the entire type here um and and the the input future types here are the the async blocks and then if you do if you do the for each still nothing happens because the future is not awaited and, and therefore not polled. But you can then await the future which polls the future essentially and um, then it starts running. It's a combinator from uh, from the uh, futures tr uh, crate. Yes, um, and actually, let's let's remove this print here and return a number, and then we get the number here, and we can print it at the end. We do it like that we get a, stre a stream out a stream of numbers that is still in order so no matter how long each individual future takes in here um, buffered will make sure to to return it in order 
if you if you do not need the um, need the output to be in order and uh, you want to gain performance because you don't have to wait for the uh, for for slower futures you can use buffered unordered uh, what's the name is it buffer unordered And in that case, it will just um, it, it the resulting stream which will just output the next future that has has become ready, or that has completed. And as you can see, the order is now not deterministic anymore because the unordered will just return you whatever it can immediately, instead of trying to preserve the order of the stream that you put in. It, it still runs in parallel, but the results are stored and ordered uh, after the running the futures has completed. Um, I, I, I can show you how this actually gets executed internally um, by, by doing something like that. Um, every time one of these futures gets pulled for the first time, it will print something. And at the end, we wait one second after each operation uh, before, b before we take out the next one. So what you will see is, wait, what? This is not what I expected. <laughs> I did expect there to be, to immediately be 10 of them. Let, let's implement a manual future that proves our point. Um, struct number future 
it has a number. <coughs> and it remembers if it has been polled or not. Also right now, um, this is unpinned, so we don't need some special pin projection stuff. Impl future for number future. The output is u size. I don't like this to be called CX. I want it to be called context, and we don't need this anonymous lifetime here. Um, so that's uh, this equals self as mute. Wait, is this actually how it works? I, I get confused when I'm using the the pin tr uh, trade. It's 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 always something I have to look up. Not ping, pin. Um, new unchecked as the ref gets a pin chat reference from this. Hmm. How do I get this out? Gets a shared reference out of a pin. Oh, that's the, the that's not get mute, which is implemented for pin exactly. That's what I want. This is self dot get mute. Uh, so now I have a mutable reference uh, to to self, um, which is possible without unsafe code here because this automatically implements the unpin trade. It's an auto trade that automatically gets implemented by the compiler. And if this dot was polled, we return poll ready number, uh, this punct number, uh, dot number, like that. Else, um, this dot was polled equals true, and we return poll pending. So the first time this this gets polled, um, also it prints that it was polled. Print line was polled. this it prints that it was pulled and then not like this the first time for the first time and then is ready problem we have now is that we uh, we need to schedule it again we, we need to call the the waker on that so hmm this is <laughs> kind of complicated how do we We can get the waker. The problem is once we return pending here, we will never be polled again unless we call the waker. So we need something that that actually calls the waker. What we can do is I, I have a very bad idea. No, I Wait, I probably can just call wake in here. 
This is probably very implementation specific for the executor, but we could get the waker and wake it like this. Not not here, but but in here, to hopefully get us scheduled again for being uh, get us scheduled for being polled again. And let's hope that this call is not. No, this call must not be synchronous, I guess. I mean, it must not in this single call call Paul on here again. So we should be fine. This might be okay. But nevertheless, let's let's just do this and derive default for, for the... Oh, actually, we need a constructor. Impl number future. Doesn't matter. I mean, it, it cannot actually call um, Paul on the future again because there's a mutable borrow, so it, it's not possible. It, it needs to be scheduled, so actually this is the correct way to implement what I'm trying to implement, although it's not very nice. New number, new size, num uh, self, self. Number was formed false like that. So what we do here is then just map to number future. Wait, number future new. Let's see what happens. Use of whatever. Sometimes the ID is just bool cannot be referenced. Can't be referenced. Cannot move out of a shared reference. Wake by ref. Yeah. Now it's doing exactly what I was hoping it would. It first pulls 10 because the buffer size was 10. And then it starts pulling them again, one by one, and uh, and returning the, the result. And once all of them are out, it, it starts pulling the, the next ones. If we were to change the order and in, in which they complete, uh, this would actually start pulling futures before all um, 10 futures are ready. Yeah. Um. There was a question, have you seen this Zbus crate? It's Rust Native saving you the pain of libdivas other crates have. Haven't been working with divas. Yeah. Um, we, we could now switch to buffer unordered and take a look at what happens then. But it's it's still doing the same thing because the the order is still deterministic. But what we could do is make it non-deterministic by adding the the sleep in here. Um, this is very ha hacky what I'm doing right now. But <laughs> from how how to how to not how to, how to not write asynchronous code, but on the way understand how things are implemented, <laughs> essentially. From milliseconds, what was it? Oh yeah. The 
random U8 as U64. Maybe 10 times. Okay. Now we need to make sure we actually sleep. First, we want to get polled the, f the first time. And once we know we have been polled, let's let's uh, turn this around. If not polled, then this. And if polled, then this is maybe easier to understand because the first time we're polled, we're doing this. The second time we're doing this. And then we're um, taking the sleep and we're pinning it. Let's hope this is possible without... Um, yeah, if sleep is unpin, we can just do this. And we now have a pinned mutable reference of sleep, which we can pull. Match pinned sleep dot... Actually, it's much easier. We can, we can just call... This dot sleep dot pin un poll unpin, which does is exactly the same thing. But let's illustrate what we're doing by doing it manually. Pin sleep dot poll, and if we get ready of whatever, we just do nothing, and if we get pending. We return poll pending. This means we now have non-determinism in there. Phantom pinned cannot be unpinned. Is it actually not unpinned? Um, Sleep is unpin. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> well, we can still <laughs> we can still just use unsafe code here. Which is safe in this context, but um, usually you would you would use um, pin project for that. In this case, it's safe because we know because we know we're not moving anything. Um, pin new unchecked. So don't be alarmed um, if you use pin project you you won't you probably won't need um, and we need the context in here so when we pull it we, we pass on the context um, you you probably won't need to, uh, to uh, write unsafe anywhere ever because of the uh, pin project crate Yeah, as you can see, because 10 was ready, or at least, yeah, because 1 was ready, it it could output 1 and start polling the next one, which is 10. And now it has to wait for 2 to be ready. Oh. Only then it starts, I'm not quite sure when it actually starts polling stuff. Oh yeah, because it's it, it's going through there in a loop. So two, four, and three, all of that is ready. Wait, what? Oh, we still have unordered in there. <laughs> I was wondering. So it immediately prints whatever is ready. And then new futures can be scheduled. But let's run it again with the ordered. Uh, uh, with the ordered variant, not the unordered variant. And as you can see, it's it first pulls ten futures, and uh, immediately zero and one 
9 and 8 are ready. So it, it went through the entire list of futures once, polling one of uh, all of them um, again because they were scheduled. And then it decides to, to get the next item from the stream, that is 10, polling some more of them, then getting another one. So it's it's not quite that easy to understand what is happening internally, but it is safe to say that it will fill gaps once they come up at some point. Meaning that um, once some of the results are ready, but not out of the uh, the other end of the stream yet, because the order wasn't correct, it will still schedule more work in the background. Not sure if that was uh, understandable. Yeah. It's a bit tricky, but yeah. Yeah, definitely. Also, what I can show you is um, what if I want to pull this out into a separate function? Let's say um, fn number stream takes a uh, say length others yeah the, these are u size and it returns a stream of it's imported stream of item u size and then we can just take this entire thing almost Put the stream in there, and now all number stream with this needs to be length. Let's say forty-two, because why not? And uh, run it like that. So this way you can pull out. Um, parts of your program and make it composable essentially I can also show you how to get rid of this unsafe code while I'm at it pin project no oh, it's it's called like the, it's written like that this is a macro Use pin project pin project. Uh, we want the number to be wait. Let's look at documentation again. Pin. Yeah, we only need to mark the one that are not unpin. So this one sleep needs to be pinned because it doesn't implement the unpin trait. Meaning um, we can call this equals self dot project. Project is automatically generated by the pin project trait. And in this case, this point sleep is already pinned. So we can just call this phone sleep dot pull. This should work. Meaning we um maybe this is still a reference, um so we need to Which types expected mutable reference to bool found bool yeah and just like that 
we don't need to write any unsafe code anymore because the pin project procedural macro generates like a, a shadow struct, a copy of this struct um, that references this one where the internals are pinned. Um, I can run cargo expand and show you what it does. And this will, uh, unless there, are, there is a bug in the pin project crate, will always be safe. So what does it do? Oh my god. <laughs> um, this is the original. And it creates the, the projection, which has... Um, wh which is borrowed from the original. That's why the lifetime is here. Um, it has a mutable reference to number, to was pulled, and a pin of m mutable borrow to the sleep in the projected one. This is what you get when you call self.project. And uh, what project does is, uh, of course, using unsafe, will borrow Wait, isn't this the wrong way? Wait a minute. Oh yeah, you know, yeah, it, it, it gets the um, the mutable reference from the pin by uh, calling the unsafe method, takes out the elements and puts them back in the uh, projected struct where only the references are in. So this struct now borrows self which is reflected in the um, lifetime here that's what it does yeah <laughs> now I close the main method uh, main file any more questions any more things to try out I think I did that earlier already by accident, but I can do it again. Make buffered into buffer unordered. And this time, as soon as one uh, uh, as something is ready, it immediately gets passed on to the output, as you can see. Ready, out, ready, out, ready, out, ready, out, immediately. Whereas if we go back to buffered, um, so one is ready, three is ready, four is ready, and so forth, but nothing is coming out the other end because zero wasn't ready yet. And only after zero is ready would it start outputting numbers, as you can see. All, of, all the uh, numbers that have been ready are up are printed out or are put out the other end of the, the stream. And now 6 becomes ready because 5 was already put out the other end. 6 gets output immediately, 7, 8, 9 and so forth. Let's just do it in order. Something about our non-determinism isn't working I guess. <laughs> Maybe because this sleep is longer than our non-determinism. Yeah. Yeah, I could just remove the sleep and then it would... Like, like the sleep on the output. Could just start printing stuff immediately. And as you can see... 21 became ready, the, the last output was 16, 21 became ready, it's not 17, so nothing is put out, uh, 24, 25, 19, 18, 17 is ready, and immediately all 
in order that have been ready 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, and so forth are, are passed through. And there, we, as you can see, we, we essentially cleared the, the size 10 buffer internally, so it needs to pull uh, new futures again, and so forth. Whereas again, with buffer ordered, unordered, it just pr immediately prints something if it's ready. Which means it can always fill up the internal buffer of concurrently running futures, which means it it's better at um, utilizing available resources. That's why buffer unordered exists, but many applications do actually require uh, the ordering, so both of them exist. One is more optimal for using up all the resources, uh, and the other one is just if you have the additional ordering constraint. Yeah. I think I will stop the uh, recording right now because it's already going almost two hours.